Hey, this is Austin St. John, Jason, the original Red Ranger. You are listening to Airland. John? Hello. How are you? I'm a little bit tired today. How are you? Uh, wrapping up the con. I'm, I'm tired. Yeah. How have you found me the convention so far? Uh, it's always been good. It's my second year, and uh, everybody's warm and friendly and outgoing. So uh, I, I enjoy it. But it's, it's just tiring, you know, all the excitement and energy. It, uh, it can wear on you after a, after a weekend of it <laughs> nonstop. Yeah, no, it definitely all just convention when you're busy and you just focus on stuff, and then suddenly when you get that little, that little split second, you're like, oh, and that's that's when it kicks in. Um, so you're one of the most you're one of the most iconic characters in the Power Range franchise. Um, did you ever think at the beginning of when you took up uh, the role of Jason that it would be like this? No, no, I had no idea. I mean. Uh, I, I had to, I mean, of course, they, they had written and they had an idea for who they wanted the leader of the show to be, but uh, I had to translate that into what I was capable of and breathe some life into it. Um, thankfully, I had some great role models, you know, my mom and dad, both leaders, uh, that I was able to draw from, and, and uh, really, that's all I did. I mean, that's where I got, that was my inspiration. Um, so... Uh, what do you think about your character as, as the franchise? What made your character what he is today, or then, shall I say? Uh, number one, humility. Um, Jason was never a uh, egomaniac. It was never about him. He always put his team first. Uh, did everything he could to avoid a fight, and then when it wasn't avoidable, he would win without remorse. Um, you know, he was never excited for the battle, but uh, he wouldn't hesitate to win it with, uh, with absolute certainty. And uh, if that meant sacrificing himself or one team member in order to save the majority, he wouldn't hesitate there either. Wouldn't like it, but he always, always did it. And uh, he was good at making the right decisions. So, always reliable. And a lot of folks want that. They don't always want glory, you know. A lot of folks want that guy who's just going to be there every single time and who ultimately is going to be man enough to make the tough decisions and uh, own it. Cool, Jason was a big role model um, when I was younger, um, especially I was gutted when you left the series, but when you came back um, as the Gold Ranger in Zia, that was it. That was one of my most favorite iconic characters, just the whole character itself. So I was very pleased that when you came back um, for Zia. Um, when you were younger, because um, you've got, you got people here who are into Power Rangers, when you were younger, what was your fandom? What did you like when you were young? Wow. I mean, I grew up on, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. Uh, Andy Griffith. I grew up on uh, Thundercats, Voltron, G.I. Joe. Uh, those, were, those were all big. But uh, probably, I mean, I didn't get to watch much TV. Uh, my, my father referred to the TV as the idiot box. Um, but it, he wanted me to go outside. He wanted me to be active. He wanted me working on languages or martial arts or study or uh, something along those lines. But probably in my early childhood, you know, four, five, six, uh, it was Looney Tunes. You know, I loved watching Elmer Fudd and, you know, Daffy Duck. I loved watching Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote. And uh, it's funny, they were blowing themselves up with dynamite, dropping each other off of, you know, cliffs and, and I mean, running each over with trains but the second our show came out people called us violent I was just like wow you guys have no concept but um, anyway it was just uh, that, that probably would have been what I watched growing up that and a lot of Bruce Lee Chuck Norris Good old Chuck. I know with like Looney Tunes, I watched that as well. And again, I remember the whole fuss of like you could have cartoons doing whatever they want. But as soon as like Power Rangers came on, there was a whole like, oh, it's the most violent show on TV. But when you looked at like shows like that, like Looney Tunes, ah, Looney Tunes, it wasn't. It was just, I don't know. I, I'd say it's something to make the kids laugh. Power Rangers taught lessons. I remember when you just said th about Thundercats and Voltron, they'd always have that lesson at the end of the yep. day. And Power Rangers taught that through. As soon as they open, or after the credit or the opening sequence, so the whole thing there was there was so much story. There's so much like lessons to be learned. You know, the whole thing in what the when you guys were doing the cleanup crew in one episode. Yep. You know, it's stuff like that that taught. Like you know, even some of my friends today they use the inspiration of Power Rangers themselves. Um, 
So after the show, you decided to become a paramedic and then join the military. What made you want to do that? Uh, well, my father was a public servant. He was a Marine. My brother's a Marine. Uh, my younger brother wasn't at the time, but has been since. Mom was the first female cop uh, in a city in New Mexico in the 70s when women didn't do that. And, uh, you know, grandfather, Army pilot in the, uh, in the Army, flew B-29s. I mean, all, all leaders, public servants, all humble. And uh, I knew that I wanted to do something, but I wasn't sure what. And uh, so I bounced. I uh, taught martial arts, uh, sometimes both at the same time, one at night, one during the day. And I finished college, worked my way through college, waiting tables, bartending and teaching. Traveled, I taught a lot, I studied a lot, and then I ran into a buddy who was a firefighter. And uh, he came to me and said, hey, you know, you're an adrenaline junk junkie, you should, uh, you should come check this out. And I thought, you know, that uh, public service requires humility, and um, I could save lives for real this time. And uh, I fell in love with it overnight. And then I just started looking for the next level and the next level and, uh, you know, EMT basic and shock trauma, cardiac tech, intermediate, uh, all the way up through paramedic. And then I found CCT paramedic and flight medic and uh, tactical medical operator and just always other levels of training. And um, just 16 years later, you know, I've got training a lot of medics. Uh, I know I've had classes that a lot of medics would, would love to have. So um, it's pretty... It's a very satisfying job, but it also is, uh, you know, like any any life or death type work, it's trying at times too. But uh, I love it, and I'm glad I got to, to have positive effect. Uh, I, did, I, did, I know just that you became a paramedic. I didn't know there was so much training that you, that you had to do. That, that's, that's incredible. And do you still keep up with it? Do you have to take, retake things at times? Oh, yeah. My, uh, my currents are all still cert, uh, uh, current. I'm with the National Registry. Every two years, you have to have a minimum of 72 CEUs that are very specific. Um, so advanced cardiac life support, CPR, pediatric life support, uh, the list goes on in various courses that you have to take and complete with success uh, by various marks. Uh, usually, most of the time, it's a minimum of 80 for the scores. And, um, you know, and those are the minimums. There's other stuff you have to study in, in addition to that, endocrine, cardiology, trauma, you know, so on and so forth, uh, ITLS, International Trauma Life Support, a lot of different things. They want to make sure you're up on the newest changes, newest guidelines, which you need in medicine uh, because it, it's changing every second. So uh, lots of training just to stay operational, much less to be at the top of your game. So every year. Um, I heard before in the panel that you were, um, you're also a teacher as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I have, uh, I've taught uh, cardiology, um, advanced cardiac life support, uh, CPR, emergency medicine, trauma. I've taught just about every aspect of uh, yeah, teaching. So, um, you know, just about every aspect of paramedicine uh, I've taught. I've worked with uh, training programs that teach EMT basic all the way through paramedic. Uh, in fact, I just had uh, a paramedic that I helped kind of, kind of coach, uh, surrogate coach, anyway, come to me today to this con. Uh, a year ago, and then again today, a year ago she was going through class, today she shows up and she's graduated. And uh, she was telling me how horrible the program was that she went through, and um, she said, you know, you should be teaching again. And she's trying really hard to get me to start up a, a program. I just don't have the time right now, I don't think. But uh, So the opportunities are there, my certs are there, my credentials are there. You know, I could show you my LinkedIn page, it would probably bore you to tears because it just goes on and on and on. But um, it's really not something I put out to the fandom because the fandom doesn't care. They're interested in what suit I wore, you know, not what I've done since then, really. Well, I know I've seen multiple posts right, since you came back into the fandom about what you've done. And I, I sometimes think that even though people want to know, oh, you know what your character's done on the show, I think it's really nice just to hear what you've done outside the show, effectively. And obviously when I see posts and when you support the, you know, the, everyone in the military, I like that. It's like not a lot of people do that. And that just stands out in my eyes quite a lot. Um, so I enjoy reading the posts on how you support everyone else, just like that. And that's, I think, what makes just everything you know, from what you've done and you know I know you don't like the word hero but I like that you've helped and supported so many people over the years and that you continue doing so yeah it's uh, you know the world's a big place nobody gets anywhere on their own hmm. and those that think they did are either foolish or 
bordering probably on megalomania. Uh, but I think that, um, well, I've gotten a lot of great places with the amazing support of people that uh, aren't always given credit uh, by people who don't stop to ask or people who assume they know how it happened. So, uh, yeah, I just had a great conversation in Rhode Island with Dean Kane. And uh, he's a big supporter, does a lot of USO tours. We were talking about heading to uh, another location in the Middle East. He found out I'd been overseas for real for four years and said, man, I'd you know, love to hang with you. I was like, yeah, I'd love to work with you too. So uh, we're going to be looking at some stuff coming up here soon, I think. Uh, and we'll see what we can come up with. You know, anything to support our boys. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Well, you, you started a project, um, Survival's End. Mm -hmm. How did that go? Or, you know, is it still in production? Uh, it went great. Uh, we shot 20% of the movie in two days, which was incredible. Uh, quite an enormous crew. We've got a little over half a million in financing. We're looking for anywhere from 100 to 250 to finish it. Mm. We're hoping to finish it uh, by next spring, uh, shooting through to, uh, to completion. But, uh, well, we've, in fact, we just finished up the graphic novel uh, maybe a week and a half ago. So I'll be putting that out maybe over the holidays. I'm not sure. I've got to sit down with the director and uh, the other company owner. We had to restructure. I had to uh, let somebody go that, um, you know, could have done better, but didn't. So um, we are now restructured, and uh, I'm hoping to finish it up early next year. We'll have the graphic novel out. We'll be getting a release, put it on the global market, and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. But I'm still really excited for the project. So what was the inspiration behind it? The director, Daniel Springen, uh, it, it was his project. He wrote it prior to knowing me. And uh, he had written this and loved the concept of it. And we met through a uh, mutual acquaintance. And uh, he was like, wow, you, you really were a medic overseas. I said, yeah. He says, and you really did just come home. I said, yeah. And he says, well, what do you think about post-apocalyptic films? I said, well, I love it. I just don't want to do any more zombies. And he went, no, no zombies. And he's like, well, I've got this premise on, you know, uh, you know, disease and a pestilence that comes out. And I was like, well, okay, that's cool, but I would change this, this, and this because here's why. And as a medic, this is, you know, more likely and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, wow, that's great. And we hit it off and A, we became friends and B, we did some, some made some minor script changes and um, went on and I just, we fell in love with it. And uh, it didn't take us long to, to pull together some money and shoot the trailer. Nice. Um, so you've set up a charity. Um, is it, uh, what, what's your charity about? It's called the Heartland Image Foundation. And uh, you can find them on Facebook at Heartland Image. Uh, you can find them uh, at heartlandimage.org. Uh, so uh, essentially, we do all sorts of things within, this, within the foundation. We're a legitimate 501c3, so tax write-offable. Uh, you can turn your receipts into the government. You'll be given credit. Uh, there's no jokes. The books are transparent. Uh, we have five members on our board, um, PhDs and, and master's degrees, people that sit uh, at Paramount uh, Movie Studios and uh, people who uh, are doing some other pretty incredible things that I'm, uh, I won't go into right now. But uh, So it's, it's legitimate. And uh, we do everything from bring school-age kids in and teach them how to shoot short films. So during the summers we get them in off the street. Uh, keep them busy for a couple weeks. They bring in their essays, they shoot their story, they put it together, cut, edit, learn everything from how to film, uh, and do all sorts of aspects, lighting, gaffing, everything from, uh, uh, for a film. And then they get a presentation, like a, a rollout. Our first one, we brought in 800 people just from the local city, and this is uh, based in Lima, Ohio. Uh, over 800 people to come in and see this project and its rollout. Local media, we were all over the place, and, and we had a great, a great success. Uh, we also work with other charities. We give money to you know the homeless and, and other things, help provide food and things like that. But in addition, we have a separate aspect of the company where we make uh, Christian-based films. And not Christian like, read the Bible, you must pray, you know, magically be healed, nothing like that. Um, but we will parallel our story with something that is in the Bible. For instance, uh, Gideon's Frontier parallels David and Goliath. And one small guy fighting this behemoth the British Army and uh, and we reference faith and you know and things like that but it's not overt um, we have a romantic comedy that we're looking to bring up uh, uh, it's called a walk with grace and uh, that's we've got a great letter of intent from uh, director Darren Scott and some other people like that 
We've got uh, We Need Heroes, which I'm looking to have some other folks in. In fact, I just had Walter Jones and Jason Narby do the uh, short film we just finished shooting in Ohio called Gideon's Frontier. So we're hoping to do the full feature next spring also. So uh, lots of projects. I've got an anime project coming up I want to do. Uh, this is outside of Heartland Image. Uh, that's St. John uh, Enterprises. And uh, just tons of stuff. I've got scripts hitting my desk. All sorts of stuff people said I couldn't do after being gone for so long. And uh, I'm doing it. That's really cool. I like the way that you just then, like when some people saying that you can do it and now you can. I like that. I just like that, that thought process of saying, you know, you said you couldn't. I'm going to do it anyway. So with um, with every single ranger, we've been doing uh, a British word game, and it's um, I tell you what the word are. You got to tell me what the the meaning is. Uh, okay. So the first one is mate. Mate, uh, brother, be it brother in arms or friend. It's uh, it's a mate, soulmate. Yep, that's correct. Uh, cheeky, cheeky. It's a bit funny, humorous. Mm, correct. Uh, give you a bell. Give you a bell. Yeah. I have no idea. Um, it means I'll call you. So I'll give you a bell. Uh, okay. Sure. I'll ring you. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, scrummy. Scrummy. Yeah. No idea. Uh, it's good food. Like, oh, that was a really scrummy dinner. Scrummy. Yeah. I have to remember that one. Yeah. Um, chuffed. Chuffed? Chuffed. Chuffed. That sounds like pissed. Uh, no. I'm not I, drunk, but <laughs> angry. Everyone said that. No, it means happy. I'm chuffed to be here. So I'm chuffed to meet all my friends. I would not get that from chuffed. I'd be like, why are you so upset? <laughs> okay. Um, fancy. Fancy. I like it. Yep, that's correct. Um, faff. Faff? Faff. No idea. Um, it means to kind of procrastinate. So I'm just faffing about getting everything ready today. All right. Um, quid. Quid. Well, I think monetary. Kind of, it's British currency. It's kind of monetary, but yeah. It's, well, that's, that's what I mean, monetary and purpose, but uh, currency. Yeah. And then it's tara. But it's an older term. More like, yeah. like I would hear that maybe from the Cockneys, not mm. so much, you know. It's like quids in or a couple of quid here. Yeah, couple still, of it's still quite used over the UK quite a bit, like, you know, quids in or I say, like, you know, oh, that's a couple of quid. Hmm. Or lend us a couple of quid. All right, cool. Okay. Uh, and then the last one is tara. Tara. Mm -hmm. Is that like hurrah? No, it's uh, goodbye. Of course. So, and there's also a song about it. Apparently, I, I can't, I can't remember what the song is, but there's a song and. So uh, instead of Kesara, Kesara, no. it would be Ketara, Ketara. We we'll have to change it up. <laughs> we'll do the British version soon. We'll make it cheeky. A cheeky one. Cool. Right. And we won't faff about it. No, nope. no procrastinating. I know I'm going to be doing that much <laughs> later on. But cool. Thank you very much. Hey, um, Absolutely. It's a pleasure to meet you. I've met you a few times, and every single time I meet you. It's just amazing, so thank you very much. Thank you, brother.